I hate it. But I love war films, especially anything World War II. Within the space of six years, there have been so many stories that came from it. But is it me, or were most of those films based on the Western Front? But if it is just me, then feel free to call me a tit in the comment. Don't get me wrong, there were great films that came out of it. A Bridge Too Far, Saving Private Ryan, Dunkirk, and the TV show Band of Brothers. But not much word coming from the Eastern Front though. Even the battle on the Pacific side got more coverage with titles like The Thin Red Line, Hacksaw Ridge, Medway, Either One Is Good, and um, Pearl Harbor. The Yanks really wanted to be the heroes, didn't they? But maybe Fowler had a point. Pushy Americans, always showing up late for every war, overpaid, oversexed, and over here. There may have been a few films about the Western Front here and there, but nothing that Hollywood really wanted to show off. But there was one film that stood out from the rest, Enemy at the Gates. This focused more on the conflict between the Germans and the Russians during one of the deadliest battles in history. And I did feel that this film may have been overlooked a little bit, but after a recent rewatch, does it still hold up? Well, let's give it the classic review treatment and let's find out, shall we? Set in the winter of 1942, during the Battle of Stalingrad, Enemy at the Gates follows the story of Vasily Zaitsev, a Russian soldier sent to the front line to defend Stalingrad from the invading German forces. He went in with a handful of bullets, no gun, and... It's hopeless, comrades! Get back! Oh, yeah, it weren't great. Deja vu! I've just been in this place before! Hiding among the corpses of his fallen comrades, he meets Commissar Danilov. And this is where we find out that Vasily is pretty good with a rifle, killing five German troops in a matter of seconds. Shortly after, Nikita Khrushchev arrives in Stalingrad, demanding new ideas on how to boost the troops' morale. Give them hope. Here the men's only choice is between German bullets and ours. But there's another way. A way of courage. A way of love of the motherland. We must publish the army newspaper again. We must tell magnificent stories, stories that exalt sacrifice, bravery. We must make them believe in a victory. So Danilov started writing newspaper articles about the heroic sharpshooter Vasily Zaitsev. After joining the sniper unit, Vasily meets Tanya Chernova from the local militia and later becomes romantically entangled. As German forces were facing heavy losses, they deploy Erwin Koenig, an elite sniper tasked with one mission, to kill Vasily and crush the Russians' morale. As both snipers engage in battle, Koenig constantly gains the upper hand over Vasily, by either taking out his fellow comrades, lowering him out of cover, or by Vasily making rookie mistakes like falling asleep. You stupid, stupid bastard! Feeling physically and emotionally drained from the fighting with Koenig, he starts doubting his ability and admits to Danilov that there is no way he can beat this man. Danilov gets pissed off with him, telling him that his ass is on the line too trying to keep the morale high with his stories. Even going as far as using a young Russian boy called Sasha as a double agent to gain information on Koenig's position. But this eventually backfires, as Sasha is caught and killed by Koenig. This lights a fire under Vasily and vows to kill him. Danilov blames himself for everything that's happened, so he decides to sacrifice himself to reveal Koenig's location. And it wasn't in vain, as Vasily finally outsmarts Koenig and ends him. Vasily reunites with Tanya two months later and the film ends. Now let's dig into this a little bit. First off, when it comes to World War II films, Enemy at the Gates is a breath of fresh air, but the air is more dust filled and has a bit of a cold feel at the back of the throat. Stemming from the film's location of Stalingrad, US troops are not storming the beaches of Normandy or dropping in from the sky behind enemy lines. These are Russians trying to protect their homeland from German invaders. And in this country, everything is backwards. There is no retreat, no surrender, and taking a step backwards on the battlefield could mean the same fate as taking a step forward. And the scariest thing about it, it was all real. Well, almost, uh, but I'll get to that bit later. Russia's success was on a knife's edge, and all of that came across in the film to near perfection. In the opening scene, there is some resemblance to Saving Private Ryan as the soldiers are about to go into battle. But the difference here is the battle is already in full swing, with the sight of Stalingrad set ablaze in full view. And whilst the troops in Saving Private Ryan were ready to storm the beaches, or as ready as they can be in that situation, the Russians were not ready at all, being dragged off the train unarmed, pushed onto a boat, and orders shouting at them whilst crossing the river, whilst also being shot at from above by the Luftwaffe. 
Sorry mate, could you say that again? James' brain matter was stuck in my ear. There was no sight of order here. Civilians trying to flee, injured Russians lay dying on the floor, and there weren't enough rifles to go around. There was only chaos and confusion, and was cracked up to 11 with James Horner's haunting score. It was also pretty cool that Call of Duty recreated this scene in the first game, and did the same with the first sniper scene in World of War. The battle that took place, however, is the only large-scale battle in the film. The rest of the action was between Vasily and Koenig, and I find this a very welcome change of pace to the explosions, gunfire, and dogfights found in other war films. It's a silent standoff between two elite sharpshooters. No snappy one-liners, no shouting matches, just two men in a game of wits, trying to outsmart each other to make that kidding blow. And this left me on the edge of my seat with every watch. Commissar Danilov has to keep the Russian troops' hope alive, because Stalin's fight or I'll kill you approach wasn't working out for him. So Danilov had to come up with these legendary stories of Vasily killing hundreds of Nazis with his rifle alone. It's quite an honest look at the forces on the Eastern Front. Like the Germans also had to use propaganda to influence their troops. But the difference was, everything was looking grim for the Russians, and the Germans could finish them off any day. There is one scene where Vasily is talking to Tanya about the troops making every moment and victory count. Because all of it might end tomorrow. So they sing, dance, drink, and... <clears throat> well, you can't say the Russians weren't creative. However, everything also depended on Vasily taking down Koenig. So, who is Vasily Zaitsev in Enemy at the Gates? Well, even though he's considered to be one of the best snipers in the world at this point, he comes off as humble and modest. He is just there to do what his country has asked him to do. Jude Law steps into this role quite nicely. He's got that everyday person charm to him, whilst holding back a secret wildcard trait, but is unafraid to show fear and doubt when things get too much to handle. Joseph finds Danilov is interesting too. He's not too afraid to voice his ideas and opinions, even in the presence of someone as powerful as Khrushchev, and he forms a bond with Vasily early on, and the friendship between them felt genuine. But it gets tested when Vasily starts questioning his own ability, and Danilov is trying to protect his reputation. Because Vasily is not the only one putting himself at risk. If Danilov fails to deliver, Khrushchev might one day hand him a pistol to avoid the red tape. And it doesn't get any easier when Tanya is involved, as a love triangle arises between the three. And I don't blame them, this is Rachel Weiss we're talking about here. But Tanya is more than just a pretty face. She's intelligent and brave, more than willing to put herself in harm's way to help Vasily, and doesn't mind slumming it with the rest of her comrades. And Vice's performance is solid. Also, I like that no one brought up the fact that she was a woman. They just got on with it. Because in World War II Russia, there were women in the Red Army. They needed all hands on deck to defend their country. So bringing up anything about being a woman would have been pointless. If you had 10 fingers and you could walk, you're in the army now. Whoa, whoa, you're in the army. Now, some people might be annoyed at the whole love triangle thing, but I personally didn't mind this. In fact, it gave us a great break away from the action. The city didn't have to do much to impress her. He was just genuine the entire time and just enjoyed each other's company. While Stanilov is a bit of a tryhard, trying to impress her by talking about books, getting her transferred to the intelligence unit and by offering her some fish. This is Philippe off my like it. Um, she'll be thrilled. It's very sweet of you. There's plenty more if you're hungry. Oh, uh, what a sick freak. <laughs> <laughs> but I did feel kind of sorry for him when he found out that she loves Vasily. How could this happen in me? Well, hopefully the others can cheer him up a little bit. <clears throat> but seriously though, they all worked well together and the performances were great. Well, almost. I mean, okay, let's get this bit out of the way. The uh, love scene between Vasily and Tanya was very awkward. They were trying to remain quiet whilst on the job. But it was just weird and, I dare say, a bit uncomfortable. I mean, I'd say it's so bad it makes the Team America scene look like a masterpiece. That's a terrible comparison. Go sit on the naughty step. 
Now, I'm not sure if people know how brilliant Bob Hoskins was. His performance as Nikita Khrushchev was a definite highlight for me. This guy is a scary dude. And he had to be because his reputation was on the line too. I want our boys to raise their heads. I want them to act like they have balls. I want them to stop shitting their pants. And shares that pressure with Vasily and Danilov. If he's disappointed, well, he'll let you know about it. This sniper business has been dragging on too long. Vodka is a luxury we have. Caviar is a luxury we have. Time is not. I assure you he will succeed. Good. It seems your destinies are entwined. Also, he's constantly angry to a point where it's almost comical, and I'm not sure if that was the intent. I don't care if you've lost half your men. Lose the other half! Okay. Right, send the other half into the maze. Yep, yeah, it's done. And lose yourself! Okay, off I go. And what about Erwin Koenig? Is he a worthy adversary to Vasily Zaitsev? Oh, definitely. Like Vasily, he's doing what his country has asked him to do. And what he does, he's very good at. He gets the upper hand on Vasily almost every single time. Even getting him cornered at one point. Only getting away with it by sheer luck. Ed Harris perfectly fits the role. Cool as a cucumber, but silently intimidating at the same time. Honestly, he almost comes off as likeable. Jesus Christ, Titch, he's a f***ing Nazi! He strikes up a friendship with Sasha, and he does genuinely seem to care for him. But at the end of the day, he is loyal to his cause and has his orders to carry out no matter what. Even if it means killing Sasha, as painful as it is for him. Enemy at the Gates has no bad performances, but I will say there are inconsistencies when it comes to accents. Laura Weiss and Harris don't put on accents, and that's absolutely fine. Hopkins does put on a slight Russian accent. It's a bit weird, but definitely not a bad performance. Fines, for the most part, doesn't put on an accent. But in one scene where he's butthurt about Vasily and Tanya and starts talking about Vasily, he puts a Russian flair on every word, and I found it hilarious. He has attempted on several occasions to escape his duties, voiced doubts on the chances of our victory, and made defeatist comments in public. The inexplicable duration of his duel with the Nazi sharpshooter can only be explained by his lack of belief in the communist ideal. What a tip. Also, Ron Perlman appears here too. His performance isn't bad, but his mannerisms and strong New Yorker accent does slip through the cracks at some points. I think the whole cast didn't need to put on accents. That way, we could have got the best out of everyone. Enemy at the Gates does this great job sucking you into this grim time period of Stalingrad. The city has been blown to due to constant aerial bombardments. It's the middle of winter and there's no ray of sunshine in sight. I'd watch this in the middle of summer and it would still give me the chilly willies. And even though the big battles weren't the main focus, you'd still know they were going on. Even whilst the standoff between Vasily and Koenig was happening, you got the sense there were two battles being fought at the same time. And again, I have to mention the late James Horner's score. The Oscar winner could make the most beautiful and most haunting of score. At some points, it really caught me off guard and is legit the stuff of nightmares. Adding to the immersion of the horrifying reality of war. Especially that little bit of brass that lets you know that danger is just around the corner. Yeah, that bit. Just imagine that following you around everywhere. Right, time for a snack, I think. Where's my cherry yogurt? Ma, where have bog roll? Yeah, tell you what, it's actually quite a nice day today. You know, I think I might just go for a walk. Oh, trying dog shit. So far, I've mostly praised performances, storytelling, and atmosphere. But there's still one question that remains. Is Enemy at the Gates accurate? Sort of? Okay, in this film, 
With every truth, there is a bit of fabrication. One example being that even though the Russians were underarmed, they never sent any troops into battle without a weapon. Which does actually make sense. Stalin may have been a crazy dictator, but he wasn't an idiot. Also adding that while Stalin did sign off on Order 227, known as Not One Step Back, which basically meant no retreat without orders, no deserters were shot on site trying to flee. Instead, they were sent to the penal battalion, which pretty much meant you were going to die anyway. And yes, Vasily Saitsev and Tanya Chernova did have a romantic relationship, but it never went beyond the war. In the film, Tanya was hit by shrapnel from artillery fire. But in reality, at some point, a woman in front of her stepped on a landmine. Shit! And they never saw each other again after that. But probably the most inaccurate part of Enemy at the Gates is the rivalry between Zaitsev and Koenig. There is no proof that Koenig actually existed. I'm not saying that Vasily didn't have a showdown with a Jerry sharpshooter, but there is no record of Koenig anywhere. So I guess it does dampen things a bit. One thing I think they should have shown more was Vasily's kill count. By the end of the conflict, he managed 225 kills. But do you know how many on-screen kills he got before he faced Koenig? Five, and those were in the same scene I mentioned earlier. Don't get me wrong, war is bad and should never be glorified. But a few more headshots may have established him as the Soviet hero he was made out to be. There are a few more inaccuracies, but I'm not going to mention any of them because that will be just nitpicking at this point. But if you do want to know more about the Battle of Stalingrad, I recommend the Armchair Historian's video on the subject. Tell him Uncle Titch sent you. All in all, is Enemy at the Gates going to please the history buffs? Not all of them. But if you can look past it all, there is a very good war film here. A very well told story in a grim setting, but with enough optimism to get you through. Likeable characters, with the balls to create a cool and understandable villain. Still a Nazi though, dickhead. And even though there are a few awkward accents, the performances from the cast are top notch. All held together with an underrated score. And torn apart again by the jiggy with it scene. Well that was fucking dreadful. But with all that being said, I highly recommend this one, especially if you love war films. And if this film was a candle, it will be put right in the corner, and I believe it would never go out. Well, unless someone. <coughs> and that was my classic review of Enemy at the Gates. But what do you guys think? Leave a comment down below and let me in the know. And that's about everything for today, my friends, and thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like what you saw, make sure you like, share and subscribe, hit that bell for notifications and follow me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. I've been Titch and I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care. I don't want to panic anyone, but I'm rapidly losing consciousness. <laughs> oh Christ, here comes another one. No, Spucko, no! Mine is strongbox full of exploding carrots! <laughs> Cold? I hate Alaska. Boy, oh boy, that woman is built all right. They're coming. Now we'll see how these Russians deal with a crack SS division. Hans, I've just noticed something. These communists are all cowards. Have you looked at our caps recently? Our caps? They've got skulls on them. <laughs> have you noticed that our caps have actually got little pictures of skulls on them? I don't, uh... Hans. Are we the baddies? <laughs> I've got tomorrow's editorial. When you sleep with someone, you're sleeping with everyone they ever slept with. Does that make you gay? Yes, yes, it does. Meryl, get down. Ah! Meryl. Ah! 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 This is so romantic. Well, it's about to get a little bit more romantic. A little <gasps> candlelight. Oh. And a little bud light. Mm. Mm. Do you smell barbecue? Oh! Fresh, smooth, real bud light.